We'd like to begin tonight by saying a few words about the horrific mass shootings in Dayton and El Paso. This was a heartbreaking weekend of unspeakable tragedy, and yet one that disturbingly feels all too familiar. Of course, as we all know by now, there's an epidemic of gun violence and mass shootings in this country, and no matter how difficult, we cannot become numb to it. But it's also not just about guns. The shooting in El Paso was an act of white supremacist domestic terrorism, specifically targeting Hispanics. It's a threat that is growing and real. These are facts we must look squarely in the eye. No matter how monstrous the spread of violent white supremacy has been fueled by racist vitriol, warning of invasions by immigrants, language that is frequently echoed by right-wing media outlets, and of course the president. And on top of that, there is of course too much easy access to weapons of war that should be outlawed. This is a moment that demands moral clarity and urgency from our political leaders. And so now that we're seeing the political world react, we thought we might at least try to offer a few thoughts on what's happening. For more on this, it's time for a closer look. As of Sunday, we have had 251 mass shootings in this country in just 216 days. And first, let's just make clear right off the bat that we know there is a clear correlation between the number of guns we have in this country and the number of gun-related deaths we have in this country. For one thing, America has 4.4 percent of the world's population, but almost half of its civilian-owned guns. I mean, just look at this chart from the website Vox comparing gun ownership to gun-related deaths. Here are a bunch of other developed countries, and here's where we are. We're farther away from the U.K. on this chart than we are in real life. There are proven, straightforward, widely popular ways that we can at least begin to address this epidemic of gun violence. And then, of course, there's the issue of the president's racist, anti-immigrant rhetoric and the growing threat of white supremacy. Our political leaders should have to answer for where they stand on these issues. And yet, at first, some senior Republicans refused to even go on TV and answer questions about it. As CNN's Jake Tapper noted on his show on Sunday morning. We're going to talk with at least four presidential candidates today about what they would do to stop this epidemic of mass shootings and shootings. We should note that we invited the Republican governor, lieutenant governor, and both Republican U.S. senators representing Texas to join us this morning. They all declined. The Republican governor of Ohio also declined. We also asked the White House to provide someone to discuss these shootings. That request, too, was declined. So basically, we tried to get the Republican governor, lieutenant governor, senior senator, junior senator, the Republican dog catcher, the Republican sanitation commissioner. We even tried to get the Republican elephant, but it literally ran away. <laughs> Let me just say, as a general rule, when you're spending all of your time dodging questions from journalists or reporters, that usually means you're on the wrong side of history. It's like when the president tweeted his racist attacks on four Democratic congresswomen of color, and Republicans literally ran into elevators to avoid reporters. He said that these progressive congresswomen should go back to their country. I'm wondering what your reaction is to that. Uh, I'm working as hard as I can on reducing health care costs. I'm not giving a daily commentary on the president's tweets. But these are, you know, racist tweets. I mean, I, I, do you have any concerns about it? The president said that these minority congressmen should go back to their countries. Do you respond? I hadn't read that, but I'll go check it out. Man, at this point, if reporters want to answer, they're going to have to start dressing up as elevator operators. <laughs> and then when Republicans finally did speak up, they acted as if the reasons for these attacks were somehow mysterious, even though we know the facts about the epidemic of gun deaths and mass shootings in this country, and we know that the threat of white supremacist terrorism is growing and real. For example, Texas Senator John Cornyn tweeted, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Sadly, there are some issues, like homelessness and these shootings, where we simply don't have all the answers. Hey, man, don't throw in a second problem like homelessness you're also not doing anything about as a smokescreen for the first problem. That's like telling your wife, there are a lot of reasons our marriage is failing, like my multiple affairs or the fact that you're always mad about my multiple affairs. <laughs> You're not going to get all the answers if you refuse to ask any of the questions. But these guys have to pretend this is some sort of unsolvable problem because they're beholden to powerful lobbies like gun manufacturers and the NRA. It's the same reason why once Republicans did start going on TV to talk about the shootings, they didn't blame virulent white supremacy or wide availability of military-style assault weapons. Instead, they once again focused on a favorite scapegoat of theirs, video games. How long are we going to let, for example, and, and ignore at the federal level particularly, 
where they can do something about the video game industry. I see a, a video game industry that, that teaches young people to kill. The idea of these video games to dehumanize individuals, to um, have a game of shooting individuals and others, I've always felt that is a problem for um, future generations and others. If you're blaming video games, you do know that other countries have video games too, right? Japan has a huge gaming culture and very few gun deaths. If video games were so influential, they should make one about Congress called Do Something. <laughs> and as we all know, as we all know, there are common sense gun safety measures that are supported by a vast majority of Americans that we could easily pass right now that would at least begin to help in reducing the frequency and intensity of these horrific attacks. In fact, the House just passed gun safety legislation a few months ago, but it's been blocked in the Senate by Mitch McConnell. And on Sunday, Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan called McConnell out on MSNBC. There is a bottleneck in the United States Senate with Mitch McConnell. We passed in the House of Representatives a few weeks back you, background checks, a basic step that 90% of the American people support. And the Republicans need to, quite frankly, get their together and stop pandering to the NRA. Damn, members of Congress are cursing on cable now. And good, if there were ever a time for cursing, this is it. This is an emergency. Next time Tim Ryan gives a speech on the House floor, C-SPAN's gonna have to bleep most of it. President Trump, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> and of course, it's not just McConnell blocking gun safety measures. It's also the gun lobby, and particularly the NRA. Even Trump, at a meeting with lawmakers after the Parkland shooting, blurted out that they were afraid of tightening gun restrictions because of the power of the NRA. It doesn't make sense that I have to wait till I'm 21 to get a handgun, but I can get this weapon at 18. I don't know. So I was just curious as to what you did in your bill. Yeah, we, you don't we, didn't, we didn't address it, Mr. President. Look, I think you know we, why? Because you're afraid of the NRA, right? I think you underestimate the power of the gun lobby. So. No, no, I'll tell you what. They do have great power. I agree with it. They have great power over you people. There are a few times I'm glad he's a moron because he just accidentally tells the truth. He's like the racist uncle at the family gathering who's constantly saying offensive stuff, but once in a while, because he has no filter, he'll just blurt out something everyone's thinking, like, that Susan really likes her wine, doesn't she? <laughs> and what is that, like her fifth glass? <laughs> now, in moments like this, you at least theoretically want a political leader to console and provide moral leadership, but we know Trump's incapable of that because of the racist vitriol. He's spewed since the day he launched his campaign. He's demonized undocumented immigrants as rapists and criminals, called migrants seeking asylum and invasion. And so it wasn't very believable when he offered this brief statement after leaving his New Jersey golf resort on Sunday. Hate has no place in our country. And we're going to take care of it. We have to get it stopped. This has been going on for years. For years and years in our country, we have to get it stopped. And a lot of things are in the works and a lot of good things. And we have done much more than most administrations, and it does, it's not really not talked about very much, but we've done actually a lot. So a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening right now. Oh, my God. Our president sounds like a guy who took too many mushrooms at a carnival. <laughs> a lot of things are happening right now. A lot of... Now, this morning, Trump spoke from the White House and condemned hatred and violence and white supremacy specifically. But, of course, it's hard to take anything he reads off a teleprompter seriously after all his previous comments. Beto O'Rourke summed it up when he offered this response to a question from a reporter about whether Trump could do anything to make things better. Is there anything in your mind that the president can do now to make this any better? Uh, what do you think? Um, you know the he's been saying? He's, he's been calling Mexican immigrants rapists and criminals. Um, I, I don't know, like, members of the press, what the f Hold on a second. You know, I, 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 it's, it's, these, um, it's these questions that you know the answers to. I mean, connect the dots about what he's been doing in this country. Um, he's not tolerating racism. He's promoting racism. He's not tolerating violence. He's inciting racism and violence in this country. So, um, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know what kind of question that is. Yeah, he's right. And again, if there was a time for swearing, this is it. In fact, with all the swearing, at the next debate, they're going to have to put Beto and Tim Ryan on a new program called C-SPAN After Dark. <laughs> and sure enough, when Trump did read off the teleprompter today, he ticked through the usual scapegoats he has in the past, mental illness, video games, and did it flatly. We must reform our mental health laws to 
better identify mentally disturbed individuals who may commit acts of violence and make sure those people not only get treatment, but when necessary, involuntary confinement. Mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. First of all, he's wrong. Second, he sounds like a fourth grader auditioning for the role of the scarecrow in Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I would like a line. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> this was a horrific weekend of tragedy and heartbreak that no one should ever have to bear. All decent people everywhere should set themselves to the task of stopping this and expressing solidarity with and support for the oppressed, marginalized communities targeted by this hatred and violence. And as for our political leaders, the ones who are supposed to be protecting us, all we say is they need to get their together. This has been a closer look.